Welcome to Smart Women Talk. This is your host, Katana Abbott. I'm a midlife millionaire coach and a certified financial planner, and I search the world for smart women and a few good men, including best-selling authors and thought leaders who are on that leading edge. So join us for conversations on money, business, health, and inspiration, so you can live with more purpose, passion, and prosperity. Hi, everyone. This is Katana Abbott, and I want to welcome you to Smart Women Talk. This is April, and we are celebrating Earth Day all month long. Earth Day is actually April 22nd. It was started 50 years ago, and we are celebrating and learning today. I'm going to be speaking with Dr. Amy Sapola, the Director of Pharmacy at the Chef's Garden, We're going to talk about what is regenerative farming, why eating the rainbow is more important than a singular superfood, and simple tips for reducing wasted food. So let me tell you a little bit. Our guest, Dr. Amy Cipolla, is a certified wellness coach, an institute for functional medicine certified practitioner, and a doctor of pharmacy with a BS in nutrition. Amy is the director of pharmacy at the Chef's Garden, and this is pharmacy with an F. She she works to help guide consumers towards a mindful relationship with food by connecting the benefits of healthy soil to healthy plants and ultimately to healthy people. As a mother of two young children, a master gardener, passionate cook, and a longtime yogi, Amy has an integrative approach to health and wellness, both personally and professionally. Amy, thank you so much for being here today. I am just thrilled that we got together. Let's just talk about the food because that's the easiest thing all of us have a relationship with, right? Yes. And I'm so happy to be here to talk about food and vegetables for Earth Day. I think there's no better time to check in and remember how important our soil and the plants are to really our overall health and well-being. 98% of the calories we eat actually come from the soil. And I don't think we often realize that. And that's from the soil or from animals that eat plants grown in the soil. And the other 2% are probably things we shouldn't be consuming anyway, right? They would be synthetic or things that aren't naturally occurring. The news, they were talking about the GMO foods that are on the shelves and how it's so prevalent now and and may, and not just in processed foods, because they said, if you're going to process foods, almost 80% of the processed foods have chemicals and, you know, gene modification type of thing, but glycosphate and, and that kind of thing in the process. But it's also in a lot of the apples and, you know, cucumbers. So, you know, I can't wait for you to share your wisdom about this whole idea of farm to table. So the first thing that I want you to talk about is you're the pharmacist, right? The doctor of pharmacy (laughs) for the chef's garden. Tell me a little bit about the chef's garden and then how you, it came about that you became this director of pharmacy with an F. Yes. So the chef's garden started over 30 years ago. And really at that time, they had lost the farm and they, because interest rates were like 24%. And it really just wasn't going to be financially sustainable to keep paying these high interest rates and getting loans year after year to keep selling their commodity goods, essentially, you know, the vegetables at at bulk pricing. And so they lost the farm, they lost everything and built back from there. And they started going to farmer's markets and met chefs. And these chefs started asking for really specific things like zucchini flower, like the zucchini blossom. And so they started really recognizing like, hey, there's a market here for this. And so working back slowly, you know, year by year, working with more chefs and more chefs, that's how they really built their business. So their business, the Chef's Garden, was really around, you know, catering to the high end chefs, the best restaurants in the world, the Michelin star restaurants. We grow 600, 800 different varieties of 
um, unique vegetables, microgreens, edible flowers, herbs, and, you know, usually smaller sizes, unique colors, unique varieties. So there's, you know, no monoculture going on at our farm. It's a lot of variety. And that's what our chefs love. And then the pandemic came and we saw the restaurant business really go away overnight in the, in a course of a few days, you know, 90% of our revenue was gone and they basically had to pivot really quickly and look at what do we do with all these vegetables? We have greenhouses full, we have, you know, the fields full of vegetables. And so that's when they decided to sell direct to consumer and start the home delivery model. People were scared to go to the grocery store, scared to get out of their homes. It was a perfect way to deliver these chef quality vegetables to consumers. And so we started that back in 2020-ish. I came on board in 2021. I actually came, I was thinking about going to culinary school and I came for a tour and talked with Chef Jamie at the Culinary Vegetable Institute. And he very kindly was like, why don't you just move here? And I was like, you know, actually I would if I had a job here, like this would be a dream. I always say it's like, the Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory of vegetables, you know, like, it's just an amazing place to be fully immersed in, like, this passion and this love of farming and vegetables and the soil. So it was really a dream. I wrote my job description, titled it Director of Pharmacy with an F and sent it. And luckily, they were willing to kind of take that risk and bring me on board. So it's been great. Really bringing together the food as medicine piece. We talk a lot in healthcare about food as medicine, but we don't always have a lot behind that, right? Like essentially, it's just saying like eat healthy food, right? But I wanted to really bring into practice, how do we bridge the gap between the farm and the farmer or the farm? How do we bridge the gap between the farmer and the healthcare system? Them. And so, you know, being able to be in this role helps me to really bridge that gap, work with both the farmer as well as the healthcare system. And how do we actually begin to prescribe vegetables? How do we appreciate the unique roles they can play in dietary intervention to help people get healthier and not have to rely on chronic medications, which oftentimes result in polypharmacy when you start putting on one and then that causes side effects or maybe like for example with statins you can have less tolerance of blood glucose at that point so your blood glucose can be impaired while you're on a statin well then you might add another medication for blood glucose right and so you know it results in this polypharmacy where you add medication after medication and I think what I hope to do is provide that alternative that like lifestyle interventions can work and it's very important to think about how are vegetables grown? What sort of soil are they grown in? Not all vegetables are created equal. Farmer Lee Jones, who um, basically Farmer Lee and Bob Jones are the brothers who are running the farm now. And Farmer Lee Jones talks about how a carrot is not a carrot is not a carrot, right? They all will taste differently depending on the soil that they're grown in. And depending on kind of the microbiology of the soil, those microbes help those plants or those vegetables to take up minerals and to be more nutrient dense. And if the soil is not alive and really functioning, your food is not going to have the nutrient density that you're hoping it will. I was some show and they were talking about how our modern agriculture uses, you know, First of all, they have to till, you know, they till and they pull all the nitrogen out of the ground and it creates carbon in the air, but it destroys the nutrients. And they have a product with a picture of a dragon that's called scorch and burn. <laughs> you know, like, let's just destroy the soil completely, right? And kill everything. And then we'll put the nitrogen from oil or however they make this artifact, this, you know, nicer product and then put the, the seeds into the ground where what, what I understand with restorative farming is they're leaving the soil with all the roots and the nutrients and the fungi and all the, you know, things that are in the creatures, the insects and the worms and stuff that are in the ground. And they put the seeds into that and then they get back much more nutritious crops without having to use a lot of chemicals and everything. 
Yeah. So regenerative farming, you know, there's a few principles that people utilize for regenerative farming and every farm and every vegetable is going to look a little different. Right. And so when we look at regenerative farming, we're looking at how do we keep roots in the soil like you're talking about? So cover cropping, crop rotation. So we're not planting the same thing in the same place year after year and just extracting nutrients. We want to think about how do you put nutrients back into the soil? And so at our farm, we use a multi-species cover crop, which means there's, you know, eight to 15 different species of plants in there. And each plant is contributing something back into the soil. And so by doing that, we're not only contributing nutrients back into the soil, helping the microbiology of the soil, we're also keeping roots in the ground, which helps reduce runoff and erosion from the farm. And that's really a big deal. Also, by putting those nutrients back in, you rely less on putting on phosphorus, putting on nitrogen-based fertilizers, which again can run off and cause problems with our waterways. Like we're up by Lake Erie and one of the big things was Lake Erie had a big algal bloom, which was not good. People couldn't drink the water for a while. And so those are the things we need to think about and prevent. And also with climate change and you know, we don't know if it's gonna be a drought or a flood, but having roots in the ground is gonna help that crop or that land to essentially tolerate that better. So it holds on to the water it has, it also absorbs water better and slows runoff so that you have less, you know, devastation and a little more resilience when it comes to variable weather. We just finished season two of Clarkston's Farm. It's a mini series. I believe it's on Netflix. It's in England and they call their farm, I think, diddly squat. <laughs> <laughs> and he's just a rebel and the town just hates him and they're fighting him. He's tried everything and he's really doing the, the regenerative farming there. And it's so educational. And what you notice is, is when you go to, you see Scotland and England and, you know, other parts of the world where they have these little, little patches of crops, right? So they're doing the, the I think it's rapeseed here. They're doing the barley here. They're doing the wheat here. But they also have fields of flowers, of wildflowers, and then they have borders of flowers everywhere. And, and one of the things I notice, and they film it on purpose, is all kinds of beautiful insects and butterflies and unbelievable birds. And it's so important to leave all that stuff. And they actually have a group of people that make fences out of the, their living fences. They take the hedge and they cut it in a certain way that the animals can't get through it. And it's just, a, it's just a plant fence. And I could go on and on, but he even built a wetlands there, you know, Amazing. a pond. Yeah. So I highly recommend watching it. And he did end up getting a restaurant. He made a farm market and a restaurant there. And it was to use his own crops and the surrounding communities crops. So kind of like going back to our roots of where we would eat. I, I'd love for you to talk about this idea of eating locally and why that's important. Because you said they started back with the with the farmer's markets going to those. Exactly. So that biodiversity is so important. It's important not only for the soil, but for the pollinators. And as far as pollinators go, we have a huge insect crisis. The number of insects are down. Insects feed our birds. The bird species are dying. Like it's, it's a major problem. Monocropping is not helpful for that by any means because it's really not much of a food source for any of those species. When we look at, um, farmers markets, getting to know your local farmer. You wanna support people who are doing things that they're passionate about and that you're in alignment right, with. So, you know, getting to know your local farmer, come out to the farm, visit the farm, see what they're doing. If they don't invite you to the farm, that might be a problem, right? And so getting to know that local farmer also lets you get closer to the food. If you think about the grocery store model, like your Brazilian honey, that's harvested. And then it has a long way to travel before it gets to you, right? And same thing with produce. It's generally picked when it's not quite ripe yet because they know it's going to be on a truck or a train for some amount of time to get where it's going. When they're not harvested at peak ripeness, those vegetables or fruits aren't going to have the nutrient density or the taste, for that matter, of fruits or vegetables that are harvested at peak ripeness. And so 
For example, like at our farm, we ship nationwide. We ship to all 50 states and actually 17 different countries, but we only harvest to order. We're not just harvesting and then sitting on it and hoping we sell it weeks later. If you place an order, it gets harvested and the next day it gets shipped overnight to your home. And I think that's part of the beauty of a farmer's market too, is the farmer is likely picking the day before or that morning even, and then you're getting that food to your table quickly, resulting in less nutrient loss and also better flavor because you're picking those vegetables at peak ripeness. And they really do taste different. So now I'm going to actually hold this up for everyone to see and see this beautiful box of vegetables. This is what I ordered from the chef's garden. So I want to hold this back from the chef's garden, but it's Farmer Jones Farm. Yes, Farmer and Jones. what was interesting, they were, you can see it's absolutely gorgeous and colorful. And it was so delicious. Like the lettuce, the, the greens, they were just, the way it was shipped was beautiful. And I have to say, I ordered the cookbook because some of the things I've never had, I've heard of these things, but Jerusalem artichokes and abi and the kohlrabi greens. So those are both things I can't wait to, to use the cookbook for. The other thing was, I'm not sure if it was a fall radish. I think they were beets that came in there. I haven't done those yet. But the little baby radishes were just, each one was with the leaves on top and individually. Yeah. And so I was able to decorate the salads. But then this is what flipped me out. I got the mixed sorrel and the micro salad sensation, which I put that on top of my salad. And then the edible flowers, which were so beautiful, went on my fruit and my salads. My kids love those edible flowers. We make ice cubes with them. So we'll freeze them in ice cubes. And then in a drink, oh. they're so pretty. Or if you make like, for my daughter's birthday party, we did cupcakes and then put the flower, the edible flowers on it instead of sprinkles. And they're so beautiful, but they just add that pop of color and that vibrancy. I think flowers are like the fullest expression of a plant. And one of the things we're really passionate about at the farm is how do we use all parts of the plant, right? So all of the edible parts, whether it's the root or it's the stem or the leaves or the flower or even the seeds. So thinking about ways to utilize and cook with all of those different parts. And that's what we've learned over the years from chefs as well. They'll come out to the farm and walk through the fields and notice something that they haven't tried before and try it. And then all of a sudden we're growing that for them. Right. And so it's a really neat way to honor the life of the entire plant, the whole life cycle and really reduce waste. And, you know, I think, what you were showing is the best of the season box. And that's one of my favorite boxes because that box is literally the best of the season. Whatever we have right now that's in season and we're a seasonal farm. And so, you know, we're in Ohio in the middle of winter, you're not going to get tomatoes. However, eating with the seasons, there's really benefit to that. We, we do store root vegetables over the winter, just like our grandparents did. And we have fresh greens and microgreens and herbs. But then come springtime, you get into all those beautiful spring vegetables as well. We're getting so excited for asparagus right now. You can just see it starting and rhubarb, right? And so, you know, having that variety throughout the year means that you're getting that diversity. And just like I talked about in the soil, the microbial diversity in the soil is really important, but it's so important to have diversity in our diet because diversity in the diet allows you to take in more phytonutrients and the phytonutrients don't have any calories, but they do have a lot of benefits and phytonutrients are things like beta carotene and chlorophyll and anthocyanins. Like they're the color, the fragrance, the taste of the vegetables. Those are phytonutrients and they help support our immune system. They're antioxidant, they're anti-inflammatory. And so there's over 25,000 different types of phytonutrients. So the more color and variety you can get in the food you're eating, the better off you are. Let's talk a little bit about getting your fruits and vegetables from pills or from a powder that you put in your shake versus the actual fruits and vegetables. And is there a difference or are you really able to capture all that? Yes. Oh my gosh. This is one of my favorite questions because as a pharmacist, people ask me this all the time. And what I would say is there's an innate wisdom to plants that we cannot replicate. When you look at studies of antioxidants, 
Antioxidants taken in isolation. So if you extract a specific antioxidant from a plant and take it as a capsule, that is not going to have the same benefits as the plant in its whole form. And sometimes are very reductionist. Plants have, like I mentioned, up to 25,000 different phytochemicals possible. Each plant has hundreds to thousands of phytochemicals. So to believe that there's one single compound in there that is giving the plant all of its benefits is probably untrue. And so getting the fiber, the complete matrix of the plant and kind of that wisdom of how the plant grows and why those different phytochemicals are in that plant and the different roles they play in helping you to actually absorb those nutrients. Turmeric is a really good example of this. So turmeric cur contains curcumin. Curcumin is what we say gives it its anti-inflammatory effects. And they've extracted curcumin that you can take it separately as a supplement. However, it has really, really, really poor absorption and is actually better absorbed as part of the whole. And we do all sorts of stuff like trying to make it in different like nano matrices and like different formulations, putting it in liposomes, you know, putting it with black pepper, all of those things, but literally just having turmeric with some fat and with some black pepper, you're going to have really good absorption. And you can no, actually- no, 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 wait, when you say have some turmeric, is it this, this seasoning or are you talking about a turmeric root? I'm not sure. Yeah. So kind of the same thing. You can buy like turmeric powder, which people- The seasoning. Curries. Yep. Some people will put it in curries. The powder is just the root that's been dried and put into a powder okay. pool. And that orange color, that bright, bright orange, like the darker orange it is, the more curcumin it's going to have in it. You really want that bright, vibrant color. And I talk all the time about eating with your eyes. How do you actually look at your food and appreciate, like, is it really bright and vibrant? And is the color what you would expect, not really like dull and looking kind of old, right? But when you look at it and it has that bright color, you know that it's higher in phytonutrients and those darker, richer, deeper colors, like the purples and the blues and the dark greens, those are some of the richest sources of phytonutrients. Wow. Yeah. Let's talk about the greens. I got those beautiful little radishes. And then I have to say the carrots, my husband, we were having the kids over for Sunday roast beef dinner. We had the potatoes in there and there was carrots. And I think it was the yellow was, I'm sure they were turnips perhaps, but they were little babies. And so my husband went and prepared the carrots and potatoes and he came to me, goes, don't ever have me deal with those small carrots like that again. I felt like I was working so hard and I went in and he, had, he hadn't even done them all. And it just took me a few seconds to do it. And, and I realized that they were going to be just so sweet and delicious, unlike anything he's ever had. Yes. And, and they, we probably had our ice carrots, which actually were in the ground over the winter. The and itty they, bitty ones. Yes. And they get even oh. sweeter over the winter and they just dig them up. We have them for like two weeks. And they had a little bit of tops on them, maybe. And, you yes. know, they are so good and so sweet. But those carrots have been in the ground over the winter. Well, you know, I had got out a cast iron pan and I did, I caramelized them in some butter and olive oil, added some, some salt and a touch of maple syrup to oh, them. Wow. And they were such a hit. I mean, they were just so delicious, like nothing we've ever had. So my question is, though, for the greens off the carrots, the greens off the radishes, how do we know which of those greens are edible? The beet greens, you know, yeah. I know that you eat kale and you can buy some of the other green collard greens, for example. But what happens when you buy these roots and you have those beautiful greens? What do we can which ones do we eat? Yeah, such a good question. And we actually and is have, it a good idea? <laughs> yeah, we have a laboratory on site at the chef's garden. And in our lab, we looked at the mineral content of the root versus the mineral content of the leaves. Beets, for example, when you look at a beet, like the red beet versus the leaves, the leaves actually have higher minerals, like a higher mineral content than the root itself. And so I always say never throw away your greens. Whether you want to just save them and throw them in the freezer and use them for a soup or a stock, or you want to saute them or just kind of cut them up and put them in a salad, it's a great idea to use your greens. And it really, again, acknowledges and kind of 
has reverence for the whole life of the plant. And so I think, you know, it's up to you whether you want to eat turnip tops or not. Sometimes it depends. Or radish tops, you can. They're definitely edible. It's your own taste. And I say taste it. Like take a little bite, especially when they're on the younger side. They're generally more tender. Sometimes they can be a little fuzzy or like prickly. So, I mean, if they're cooked, that's going to go away. But it's really up to you whether you choose to eat that or not. But oftentimes just saving it and putting it in a stock or stew lets you maintain those minerals. And that's a really nice little trick. I talk about a lot of times like getting our vitamins and minerals from our food versus like a multivitamin, right? And that's one of the great ways is how do you, again, if you're boiling your vegetables, you're losing so many nutrients in the boiling water. And so how do you keep those nutrients in there and make sure that you're getting the best absorption you can and getting the most benefit from the vegetables that you're eating? Okay, well, how do we do that then? Because, you know, and what is boiling it like I I will put use a lot of times I'll put water in the bottom and I'll steam. Yeah. So that's one great, like a couple tablespoons of water in a pan with a lid to steam is perfect. That's a great way to not lose a lot of nutrients. What I'm talking about is when you cut vegetables and you put them in, submerge them in water and you boil them, especially when they're cut and you boil them like potatoes, for example. If you're going to boil, leave the vegetables whole and leave the skin on so that they can boil whole and don't lose or leach nutrients as much. Ideally, roast, bake, saute, steam, you know, those type of methods where you're maintaining kind of the nutrients within the vegetable are great. I love talking about carrots as well as tomato sauce because carrots cooked actually will have more beta carotene than carrots raw. And having a little fat with that actually helps you absorb it. Beta carotene in our bodies is converted to vitamin A and vitamins A, D, E, and K are all fat soluble. And so a little bit of fat, like 2.4 grams is the exact amount, but you know, two or three grams of fat, which is not much can really change your absorption of those fat soluble vitamins and optimize how much you're getting. I also like to say, don't peel your carrots. Don't peel your potatoes. You know, if you have to peel your beets, I just trim them, but that skin is where a lot of the nutrients are focused. And so when we look at like the little carrot, like snack carrots in the store, those are the cores of carrots and those are the least nutrient dense part of the carrot. So it saves you time, which I love with two young kids, you know, anything I can do in the kitchen to save time is important, but it also maintains the nutrients of the vegetable. And so keep your, keep your peels. If you must peel your carrots or you must peel your potatoes, save them in a bag in the freezer. Again, throw that in a stock eventually, and then it, you'll get those nutrients. But those would be a few of my tips. Okay. And you talked about food as medicine. So one of the things I'm trying to get more of is vitamin C without just eating a bunch of lemons and limes and the citrus. What I believe is there are certain vegetables that are high in vitamin C. And just for all the women listening or watching, vitamin C is a great antioxidant and anti-aging from what I know. And you're the expert. Is that true? Correct. Vitamin C is great for that. And, you know, great as an antioxidant. Interestingly, vitamin C decreases pretty rapidly once the vegetable is harvested. It also decreases with cooking. So when we cook vegetables, sometimes it increases the nutrients, sometimes it decreases them. And that's why it's important to have a mix of cooked and raw vegetables. So vitamin C, one of the things I think of in vegetables is peppers. So like bell peppers, especially red, orange, and yellow are going to be some of your highest um, vegetables and vitamin C and they're a great source. So I love those. I also just say, you know, a variety of colorful vegetables, you're going to get some vitamin C, especially if they're freshly harvested. If they've been sitting around a long time, that's going to degrade a little, but ultimately, you know, it does help to have them harvested fresh. One of the things I also like to talk about is we oftentimes assume we're getting everything we need from our food. And we know that a good proportion, upwards of 60% of our food on the standard American diet is ultra processed food. And because of that, 
we really aren't getting the vitamins and minerals we need. And so when you look at NHANES, which is a pretty large study looking at almost 17,000 different people, they found 100% of people they looked at were deficient in potassium, 94% were vitamin D deficient, 89% were deficient in vitamin E, vitamin K, 67%. And that's just from our green leafy vegetables. Magnesium, which is one of my favorite minerals for women, like across the board, I love magnesium. 52% of people were deficient in magnesium. And then vitamin A, vitamin C, calcium was 40 to 50%. So, I mean, vitamin deficiency and mineral deficiency is really widespread. And I think it's important to think about having that diversity, where your food is grown, what type of soil it's grown in. And then also like, how can you optimize your cooking techniques to get the most out of it that you can? Oh, that is so beautiful. I mentioned about my box, right? My beautiful box. Look at how pretty that is of vegetables. Like to get a box like that every month, for example, you know, when the lettuce, you eat that up first, right? Yeah. But everything else is, is, you know, you're, you're a lot of root vegetables came in mind. So I can use those, you know, for the whole month, let's say, cause I store them in a dark spot and everything, mm-hmm. a dry, dark drawer. So if someone were to do that and they did it properly with the proper type of cooking, what kind of nutrients would they be getting from this kind of a box of vegetables? For example, apparently you pick it fresh, fine ripened, pick it fresh, and then it's, and then it came chilled. So it seemed like it had been shipped really quickly. Yes, exactly. And the beautiful thing about that is it's like a multivitamin. It's not that it's one nutrient, but it's all of the nutrients, right? Other than vitamin D, which you're going to get from the sunlight or from mushrooms. But for the most part, the majority of your vitamins and minerals, you're going to find in vegetables. Vitamin B12 would be the other thing to think about as well. And, you know, if you're vegan, like nutritional yeast that's fortified, or if you're not, that meat would have it. But I think, you know, having those vegetables and the variety of vegetables is going to help you hit all of those different vitamin and mineral targets, plus get the phytonutrients. And that's what's really missing out of processed food is, you know, it has calories, certainly, it has the macronutrients, but in the processing, a lot of the valuable components like the vitamins and minerals and phytonutrients, those are really destroyed in that processing. And when we talk about ultra processed foods, those are the things that you really can't make at home. Like you're not going to make Doritos at home, right? Those are the things that are highly manufactured, highly processed. Generally, if you have more than five or six ingredients on the ingredient label, especially if they're ones you can't pronounce, it's probably an ultra processed food. And a lot of them will hide as things that are healthy, I see a lot now in the grocery store, things will say like plant-based or, you know, all sorts of different terminology, but especially when it says plant-based, but then has this long ingredients of like protein, pea protein isolate or soy protein isolate. Like those are really should be triggering words to let you know this is highly processed. Yes, absolutely. Well, this has just been so interesting and encouraging, I think, for all of us, and especially us moms out there that have kids, we want to teach them how to cook and where to to buy their vegetables and their fruits. So we promised some tips on food waste. And we were talking about what are the stats on how much of our food is wasted. And then for Earth Day, I'd love you to give us a couple tips on how we can waste less since we're at the top of the hour here. Absolutely. About 40% of food in America is thrown away. And I talked Mm -hmm. with Chef Ismail Samad on our podcast. And one of the things I liked is he reframed food waste as it's wasted food. And I think, you know, keeping it in that context of this is food and not just garbage, right? And so how do we keep that around and utilize it fully? And I talked about saving scraps in your freezer and using it as a stock. Also, I like to think of eating the whole plant, like we talked about eating the greens, eating the root, eating the flowers, if you have flowers, you know, whatever you can do to enjoy the whole plant, as long as that's safe with the plant that you have in front of you. And then also looking at fermentation, how do we preserve food? Fermentation, quick pickling, freezing, those are three of the best ways to preserve the nutrients in food. Canning does take a lot of heat and time, and you can have some nutrient loss there. But if you're picking something at peak brightness and you have too much, 
Freezing it is a great option that doesn't take a lot of time. Sometimes you want to blanch the vegetable first, lay it on a tray, freeze it, and then stick it in like a freezer bag. But that can be a really nice way. Or if you're in a time crunch and you want to buy vegetables at the grocery store, but you don't want to go with canned, you're trying to avoid BPA and all those things. Frozen vegetables are more nutrient dense and they're going to be a really nice quick time saver. When it comes to fermentation, everyone's interested now in gut health and it is so important. In functional medicine, we talk about all the time, like everything starts in the gut. 70% of our immune system lines the gut, our, the gut brain connection when we look at mood and health is very, very important. And so when we look at our digestion, it's not about having a single species there. And oftentimes that's kind of what's sold to us with probiotics is like this one species or even these five or eight or 10 different species of microbes are what's going to make your gut healthy. That's not it at all. As long as you're taking that probiotic, it's going to have an effect. But when you stop, that effect is transient. The only way to change your microbiome is to actually change your diet and lifestyle. So, you know, your environment has a really big impact on your microbiome, even more so than your genetics. So looking at fermented foods, and it doesn't have to be a lot, literally a forkful a day is enough. And I'm talking about sauerkraut. Very soon we're partnering with Wake Robin to do fermented asparagus for spring. We did pickles. So looking in the refrigerator section, you should not find these on the store shelf. They will be in the refrigerator section. And oftentimes they'll say something about live and active cultures. Like if you're looking at yogurt, but you want fermented foods that are alive. And that is really, really good for our gut. And also a way to preserve nutrients. Those ferments contain more of some nutrients than the vegetables did before they were fermented because of the bacteria acting on the vegetables, they produce nutrients as well. So really a great way and one of the safest preservation techniques there is. You can also look at meal planning and some, that's something that's kind of underappreciated sometimes when it comes to wasted food is if you have a plan for everything that's in your fridge, you're way less likely to end up with stuff in the back that never gets used. And so thinking about and taking a moment each week to just think about what you need for the week and make sure you have that on hand and how to utilize those things that are getting pushed to the back and otherwise forgotten. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. So it's so great if we do make that meal plan, you know, now you can actually go online, you can order groceries that you need, go pick them up. So even someone who's, and you can order organic you know, they'll go through and get the organic for you. And then I still think, you know, this farm box, I really want to get that as the staple that we have coming and every month. We also have a build your own box, which is a great option, especially if you're interested in health. If you go on our website, farmerjonesfarm.com under pharmacy, we have a build your own pharmacy box and you can look by the health condition you're interested in. So if you're interested in thyroid or heart health, or pregnancy. Like I think the best gift for someone postpartum or even who's pregnant, like if you just have a baby to send a box of beautiful, vibrant vegetables is such an amazing gift. But we have all of these different categories, even MS, we have brain health and you can go on there and Basically, I've sorted it by vegetables that have some evidence to support their use in these conditions. And you can build your own box based on your health conditions that meets mm. your needs. And you can do it at any frequency. We also have the subscription boxes. We have an Eat the Rainbow box, which is focused on phytonutrients and color. And again, color is creativity. Color is vibrancy. But color is also phytonutrients. Oh, that's fantastic. Well, it's been so wonderful having you here today. We have to end. I could talk to you forever, but you, you've you touched a lot of things I had. I had posted pictures of my salads and, and my flowers and that when I got my box, I started posting that on my personal Facebook and I got all kinds of comments about how excited people are to learn about the soil and to learn about what, what it is you do. So you've really enriched our lives today. And I, I want to thank you for being here to celebrate Earth Day. And it's Farmer Jones Farm. Say it because you, because you said it fast, it could be taken as John, but oh, it's I'm Farmer sorry. Jones. So yes. FarmerJonesFarm.com. And you can find us on Instagram okay. and Facebook at Farmer Jones Farm. And you can find us on YouTube at The Chef's Garden. I have various cooking videos on there as well as our chefs at the Culinary Vegetable Institute. And you can find our podcasts on there as well. Our podcast is Farming for Health. 
Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Wonderful. Thank you for being here. And everyone, thank you so much for being here on Smart Women Talk. And we invite you to come join our free community so you can get on our list. You'll know who our guests are. You'll get all kinds of free goodies. You'll get to access our academy. And until our next show, go out and live with more purpose, passion, and prosperity. Smart Women Talk is brought to you by Smart Women's Empowerment, a 501c3 nonprofit project of United Charitable. Music by Bill Lucas from his album, When It Rains. Available on Apple, Music, and Spotify. Catch us wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. And be sure to join our free community at joinsmartwomen.com to access all our free Smart Women resources.